Today, as we come to the table, they're not thinking more highly of themselves than they ought. They just love the Lord. They're doing what they're called to do. And it's a beautiful musical note to the Lord. You know, it's interesting. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but did you know that only smaller birds sing? You'll never hear a musical note come from an eagle in all your life or a turkey or an ostrich. Now you'll hear them make noise, but you'll never hear a musical note come from them, but you will hear sweet music from a canary, a wren, and a lark, as well as many other small birds. What is my point? God doesn't need a big bird to make beautiful music. God needs a heart that loves him. When you bring your offering to God, whether it is in song, in tithe, in the work that you do, or the things you create, it doesn't matter how popular you are. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. It doesn't matter how much influence you have. God isn't looking for the strongest or the most powerful. He's looking for a heart that loves Him. When you bring Him your offering with a heart that is turned toward Him, He's well pleased. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. So bring your offering to Him today. Bring Him the first and the best of everything you are and everything you have, and bring it to Him with a heart that is turned toward Him in gratitude. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Acts chapter 18 as he begins his message, Instructed More Accurately. Praise the Lord. You guys find your seats there. Grab your Bibles. Let's open them up to Acts chapter 18. As we finish up Acts 18 today, and we're actually going to be covering verses 18 through 28, but I want to start reading in verse 24 to the end, and then we'll go back and look at all of it from the beginning. Notice in 18, 24, it says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. And this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word this morning, and I pray, God, that you would just, again, teach us, Lord, about what that missing part might be. Maybe someone in here has something missing this morning. They're a believer. They've given their life to you like Apollos. They are mighty in the scriptures. Lord, they have studied. They've done all the things. Maybe even they're a good speaker, but when it comes to being bold in front of others, when it comes to sharing their faith, they clam up. They don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. They don't walk in love or power. And Lord, I believe that's what was going on with Apollos this morning. And I pray, God, that as we look at your word, you would open your word to us. And if anyone is here that feels that way this morning, whether they may not even feel they're eloquent at anything, but they feel they're lacking power, they feel something is missing in their Christian walk, I just pray this morning, God, that you would do a work to show them what that is and that you would, Lord, add that missing element by the power of your spirit, through your spirit, and by your spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Interesting man, Apollos. We see today a man by the name of Apollos from Alexandria who's going to be ministering in Ephesus. And he's a man that was mighty in the scriptures, mighty in word, very charismatic from what the scripture seems to indicate. But there was something missing in his life. We are also going to see something else very interesting about this man. He was a man that was very humble. Although he had this great education, he wasn't puffed up like a lot of people. You know, the Bible says knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And the danger of getting a lot of knowledge, if there is a danger to that, is becoming prideful. The good thing about love is that love always keeps you humble. And love keeps you broken. And love keeps you open. And the thing I love about the story today with Apollos is he was a man that was able to receive instruction, yet he was the man giving the message. And so it's an instruction 
in humility and instruction in sharing the gospel in power. You know, I've entitled today, Instructed More Accurately, because that's what we're going to see today that Aquila and Priscilla do with Apollos. This man they run across, they're going to instruct him in the Word of God. And what's exciting to me about that is, is the Bible doesn't say that Aquila and Priscilla were uh, special intellects or that they had some special knowledge or ability. Now, granted, they had spent a year and a half with Paul. Uh, we know that Paul was in Corinth for a year and a half. And I think after spending a year and a half with Paul, you probably would have a pretty good grasp of the Scripture. You probably would have a pretty good understanding of the working of the Lord in someone's life. So they did have that advantage, whereas Apollos had the school learning. He was what we would call a seminary degreed guy. And now we're going to see the seminary degreed guy with those who simply walked with the Lord and were instructed by other believers and sharing where he was missing it. Because we're going to see that Apollos, although he was mighty in these areas, he was missing it in what God had for him. He had not yet arrived. And I believe that, well, I know that all of us are in that same place, that we need to be instructed more openly and instructed more fully. You know, it's interesting. James says, let there be few teachers. And the reason for that is because we all make many mistakes. I would never intentionally teach you something wrong or mislead you. But I understand the reality is that I'm a man. And I trust in the Lord as I spend time in his word and prayer to show me what it is he wants me to share. And I have to be a student to show myself studied, approved in the word of God, even as you do if you're going to be sharing the word of God. But even with our studies and preparation, there's going to be times that we miss it. And when we do, we have to be open to receive from others. And what I love about today's story is, is that Apollos not only knew he needed to receive from others, he was open to do it. How many of you have wanted to go to your pastor or someone else who's sharing the word of God and say, you know, I appreciate what you said here, but I'm not quite sure I'm seeing it. What about this verse here? Or what about what it says here or whatever? I think you need to be courageous to do that. Not, not in a defiant way, but in an honest way. In a heartfelt way to say, you know what, Mark, I, I heard what you taught on Sunday, but what about this verse here? And I'll tell you what happens. A number of things happen. One is oftentimes it's because we need to have our view expanded of Scripture. And if we are myopic, we only see one area of Scripture, we might read one portion and think, well, that's what it means. And we can go to a pastor or someone who has studied, and they can take us to other areas of Scripture and say, now let me give you the fuller picture. And you walk away like I've done many times in speaking to those that, that I've sought out counsel from going, oh, now I get it. I understand. That's the first thing that can happen. The second thing that can happen is the pastor might say, well, you know what? I've never seen that. You're onto something here. I need to look at this. I may be wrong about this. I've had to change things. Over the years I've done ministry, I've had to correct things from the pulpit. Things that I've taught, someone has shown me, I've realized that isn't right, or God has shown me, and I come back and say, you know what, guys? I've changed my view on this. It's not that God's word changes. It's our maturity, our understanding, our growth. So we need to have that interaction one with another. So the other thing that could happen is, is thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I don't want to teach that wrong again because the Bible says I'm more accountable. And I've got to stand before him one day and he's going to say something like, why did you teach that, you know, frog lips were okay as an appetizer? I never said that in my word, right? Now, the bottom line is, is we have to understand, um, you know, what it is that God wants us to do. And we have to know the word good enough to do that. Now, the third thing that can happen from this is there can be pride in the person you're approaching. If you approach someone and you say, you know, I want to ask you about the scripture and what you're teaching, they can respond and say, who are you to question God's anointed? Who do you think you are? Listen, if someone ever says to you, who are you to challenge God's anointed? That person is filled with pride. Because whether we're God's anointed or not, we are men and we are women and we have flaws and we don't know all things. Paul said, we see in a mirror dimly through a glass dimly. Then, that is when we're in heaven, we'll see him face to face, we'll have all knowledge. Right now we see through a glass dimly. So for me or anyone else to say to you, don't touch God's anointed, how dare you question me, there's a huge pride issue going on there. The thing I like about Apollos, there wasn't a pride issue. We're going to see in today's passage, Apollos was an eloquent, well-trained scholar in what he did. It would appear from what it says about him here and the history we're going to find about Alexandria. But at the same time, he was very humble, very approachable. I think some of the most exciting people to meet are people that are extremely gifted and that God has lifted up and they don't really even realize it. I mean, maybe they know God is using them, but there's a humility. There's a brokenness there that's real and that's sweet. And we're going to see that in Apollos today. Again, we're going to see this Aquila and Priscilla meeting him. To him, they are, who are they? Who knows, right? 
Uh, but the bottom line is, is there are these people that are going to share, and he's got ears to hear. Apollos, as we're going to see, was this man with this great education and this great wisdom who's gone out in boldness to share the Lord. And now he has someone approach him with some correction. And to his credit, he's going to receive it in humility and be the better man for it. And that brings up another point. Before we jump in, I want you guys to realize, just because someone is behind a pulpit, or maybe they're on the radio or on TV, or they have whatever, they have an audience, if you will, it doesn't mean they're great. doesn't mean that they're even right. Greatness comes from a heart that is loving the Lord and is a servant's heart. Jesus said true greatness comes from serving and humility. And it's the most beautiful music, I believe, before the throne of heaven. Not someone who is maybe even charismatic behind the pulpit, but someone who has a heart that loves the Lord and is broken for the Lord and doesn't think something about themselves beyond what they ought to think. They're not thinking more highly of themselves than they ought. They just love the Lord. They're doing what they're called to do. And it's a beautiful musical note to the Lord. You know, it's interesting. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but did you know that only smaller birds sing? You'll never hear a musical note come from an eagle in all your life or a turkey or an ostrich. Now, you'll hear them make noise, but you'll never hear a musical note come from them, but you will hear sweet music from a canary, a wren, and a lark, as well as many other small birds. What is my point? God doesn't need a big bird to make beautiful music. God needs a heart that loves him. And as you begin to love the Lord right where you are, you're making beautiful music before the throne, and you're making beautiful music to those around you. We're going to see that Apollos was this kind of man. Now, let's get the setting. Remember last week, Paul was in Corinth. He has been in Corinth now, we know from other letters and other uh, outside Scripture and Scripture itself. He's been there a year and a half, and Paul is now traveling on. God has moved in his heart to travel back towards Syria and Antioch and Jerusalem. We're going to see his journeys go that direction before he ends up in prison uh, in Caesarea and back up to Rome as we get toward the end of Acts. But Paul now is about to head off and to leave after a year and a half of ministry here. And it says in verse 18, so Paul remained a good while. That means a long time. And again, as I said, we know it was a year and a half. And then he took leave of the brethren and he sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. And he had his hair cut off at Centre, for he'd taken a vow. Now, what's going on here? First of all, where was Centre? Centre was about nine miles from Corinth. And Centre was the launching pad, if you will, back to the Mediterranean toward Jerusalem, toward Israel, toward Antioch, Caesarea, that region in the Mediterranean. There was a real hazardous area around the tip of the oceans there where Corinth was. And you certainly wouldn't want to go to a port on the other side of that. It would take a long time, plus be very dangerous. So they would go to Centre, about nine miles away. They would set off and travel that direction and head on back toward the Mediterranean. So Paul now is heading off in that direction, going back towards, as we said, towards Syria, and going to end up in Israel before too long because it says that he had taken a vow. Now, it's interesting. We see here Paul took this vow that it says he cut his hair at Centre and now was going to fulfill this vow. We actually know what this vow was because there's only one vow in Scripture where we cut our hair. <laughs> the vow you make to your parents when they're mad and Numbers chapter 6. I'm just kidding. The first one was a joke. You're free to laugh. You don't have to. It's all right. No, people say, I only laugh if it's funny. Anyway, the vow that is where you cut your hair, that's how we know what it was that Paul did. Numbers chapter 6, a Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow was a vow where you said, you know what, I'm going to, Lord, I'm going to just deny myself right now and just seek you with all my heart. And it was a limited vow. You could have things in your heart you wanted to do. It's mostly just drawing close to the Lord, showing that devotion, denying yourself of the pleasures of the world, if you will, in many ways. And the Nazarite, the person who took the Nazarite vow was to stay away from anything to do with the vine, be it a grape, be it vinegar, be it wine, anything to do with the vine you stayed away from. And at the end of your vow, however long it was, you let your hair grow till the end of the vow. At the end of the vow, you would cut your hair, and then you would take your hair to the priest at the temple. You would do a peace offering at the temple of an animal. Then they would take the pieces of the animal, boil it in a cauldron of water, and then you would take the hair that you'd cut off and throw it in the fire. Again, there was a lot of symbolism there. The peace offering is now that you've set yourself apart and dedicated to the Lord. There's now peace with you and the Lord. And then he would eat, if you will, of the food that was boiled. It showed that oneness with the Lord, having a meal with the Lord. And the throwing of the hair underneath was simply the offering on the altar of what you had sacrificed. You would let your hair grow. You would not take care of it. You, now you sacrifice it. You're giving it to the Lord on the altar. And so there was all types of symbolism going on here. Paul had taken one of these vows. And he says, now I have to go back to Jerusalem. Which brings up a question. Why would Paul, being a person now set free in Christ, take a vow from the Old Testament? Don't misunderstand, Paul was not putting himself back under the law, nor was Paul being legalistic. 
Paul was simply using the freedoms that he had in Christ to honor his God the way that he had been raised. Now, there's a very clear difference here and a distinct difference between legalism and doing that. For example, if you have a certain tradition you like to do to draw near to the Lord, as long as it's not against the Word of God, you're free in Christ to do it. But when you start trying to tell people they all have to do that in order to be right with God, if you can't find it in the Bible, now you're legalistic. Now you're laying the law on people. So we're free in Christ. You don't have to do that. But Paul was free to take a vow. If Paul wanted to say, Lord, I'm going to let my hair grow. I'm not going to drink of the vine right now. I want to just seek you. It would be kind of the same today as us saying, you know what? I'm going to fast. I'm going to set aside a couple of days for a fast. I'm not going to eat anything or I'm not going to eat this or drink that or whatever. And I'm going to seek the Lord. And at the end of that, you have this offering of your heart to the Lord during it and at the very end uh, so that you can draw closer to the Lord. This is what Paul is doing. And notice it says he came to Ephesus and he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Again, Paul, this was his custom to go to the Jew first and then the Gentile, as we've already seen. And when they asked him to stay a long time with them, he did not consent. Note this, but he took leave of them saying, I must by all means keep the coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. Now, he doesn't tell us why here he must by all means keep the coming feast, but probably because of this vow. You see, in this vow, the way to satisfy the vow was to take this offering to the priest, to have the peace offering there at the Temple Mount, and then to offer the hair under the cauldron on the coals there as it burned on the Temple Mount as the peace offering was offered. And so in order for Paul to really do this the way it lined out in number six, he had to do that. And of course, Paul being a perfectionist, we see that from the scripture pretty clearly. Paul wanted to make sure that he went and he did it right. He wanted to go to Jerusalem and he wanted to make this offering the right way. So he would have been transporting his hair. But I think also Paul was probably, again, wanting uh, the Jews of Jerusalem, very possibly, I can't say for sure, but very possibly wanting them to see that he was also not opposing them if they wanted to offer a peace offering or do a Nazarite vow, but just to preach to them the freedom in Jesus Christ. And, you know, I see a lot of people today that, you know, they want to maybe celebrate a Passover feast. I have no problem with that. You're free to celebrate the Passover feast if you want. Now, if you celebrate the Passover feast because you feel you have to do it to make God happy, that's wrong. Now you're putting yourself back under the law. But if you want to celebrate the Passover one year like we did, we've done a couple times as a church in the past, to find all the symbolism of the lamb that was offered, you're free to do that. You're free in Christ to do that. And Paul, here again, using that freedom operating in that freedom, says, I'm going to head to Jerusalem. I have to be there in order to fulfill this the way that I want to fulfill it. And notice it says, when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. Now, Caesarea, right there on the coast, we're going to see that Paul gets shipped back to Caesarea before too long as he goes before the Roman officials and the governors there, Festus and all, in, in Caesarea. So he'll be back there, but then he goes on down to Antioch. Now, Antioch was interesting. Antioch was what we would call the hub of Christianity in that day. For those of you who fly and travel a lot, you know where the hubs are. You know, you get on one plane, and if you're flying Delta, they make you go to Atlanta, whether you want to go to Atlanta or not. And I always think, why in the world do I have to fly to Atlanta when I'm going the opposite direction, right? Atlanta's the hub. Antioch was the hub of Christianity. It was the meeting place. It was where the believers kind of regathered. It probably was where what we would call the yearly conferences were held, if there were such a place. It's where the Christians were first called Christian. And this is where Paul goes now to kind of go to this regrouping of all the believers to kind of say hi to everyone, to check in now after his second missionary journey to see what's going on. And notice verse 23, after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So not just wanting to be strengthened himself, but Paul being a father in the ministry, if you will, a father figure type uh, as a pastor, would go to each of the churches each of the individuals that he could make it to, and he would shore them up and encourage them. So beautiful picture of Paul. And now we see Paul settled back in the land. We'll pick up with him later again, getting in trouble down with the Jews in Jerusalem and then being shipped back up to Caesarea. But now we turn and we shift gears into verse 24 to the end, which we read at the beginning. And we finish out today by looking at this man named Apollos and Aquila and Priscilla and what they did for Apollos and what was missing in Apollos' life. Look at verse 24. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, note that, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came 
to Ephesus. Now, a couple things to note here. Eloquent here means learned. That is, Apollos was highly educated, and we'll get to more of that in just a moment. But what about Alexandria? Tell me a little bit about Alexandria. Alexandria was named after its founder, Alexander the Great, in 333 B.C., and it was for a long period the greatest existing of cities in the world. It had a moment where it was the greatest existing city on the planet. At this time, both Nineveh had collapsed, Babylon had collapsed, Rome had not yet risen to power, Alexander had taken the world over, which was right before the Roman Empire, and of course Alexander, in taking the world over, did what he wanted around the world, and he made Alexandria kind of like the city of the world, almost in in some ways you could almost see it as a Washington of the world, if you will, a place with a lot of authority, a place that was very important. This is where this Apollos was from. It had been the residence for kings of Egypt for 200 years. And it was known again as a university town. It had one of the largest libraries in the world. And this may not sound impressive to you until I explain this a little bit more, but it possessed a library that had, a very famous library, had over 700,000 volumes of books, which incidentally in AD 642 was burned in a fire. But you can imagine before the printing press how that made everyone have a gasp even in that day. But the bottom line, this was a massive library. Now, you might be saying 700,000 volumes. Probably the library downtown has a huge number of volumes. Mark, why is that so impressive? This was before the printing press. This was 700,000 scrolls, if you will, of books that were all handwritten on animal skin. (laughs) Does that give you a different picture of the kind of library that they had in those days? If you wanted to study, this is the place you went. You traveled to Alexandria to get your degree, to study, to learn more about what mankind knew in that time. And you had to go to these libraries where they were handwritten. Wait your turn. Check these things out. Look at them. Study from these. And it was a very precious and special thing in that day. And yet because of that, you had a lot of eggheads. You had a lot of intellects that were gathered in that area because a lot of them just moved there. You've got this great library. We're going to live here. We're going to learn. We're going to study. This was Apollos. Now, he was from there, if you will. And again, this gives us some indication as to why he was eloquent in speech. It was also in Alexandria that the first Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, which we know today of as the Septuagint. So if you've heard of the Septuagint, that came from Alexandria, Egypt. It was translated from Hebrew into the Greek. And so again, hence Alexandria was known for its scholars and intellectuals, and Apollos falls right into that tradition. As I said, it says he was an eloquent man. The word here literally means learned, a man of books, skilled in literature and arts, and versed in history and antiquities. In other words, this was one smart guy. But he wasn't just smart. Notice this, Apollos had charisma. He had all the student and book learning down, but he was able to get in front of people and speak. Listen to what it says about him. Secondly, it says he was mighty in the scriptures. And really the eloquent ties into what I just said. Mighty in scriptures really goes toward the knowledge side that he had. But the word mighty here is the word dunatos in the Greek, and it's derived from the word dynamite. So picture who we've got here. We've got this man by the name of Apollos who is dynamite in the scriptures and is eloquent at presenting them. And when Aquila and Priscilla see him, they say, you're missing something. Now, that's pretty amazing. Not only for them to have the insight to see that and not be intimidated by his education, but to have the boldness to go and to, to confront him on it in a loving way, in a gentle way. And it brings out a point here. Pure intellectual training does not prepare you for the gospel. If pure intellectual training prepared you for the gospel or even having the ability to get in front of people prepared you for the gospel, there'd be a lot more people that would be ready to go. Thanks for coming to the table of God's Word with Pastor Mark for his study in the book of Acts. This groundbreaking book is what spearheaded the Christian movement as we know it, recounting the beginnings of the church. What an incredible time it must have been, experiencing eyewitnesses of Jesus being passionate and bold in their faith. These disciples, who became apostles of the faith, are inspiring in their courage and in their sacrifice. It doesn't go without notice that all the original disciples were brutally killed for their faith or tortured and exiled. Why would these people do this? What was worth risking and even losing their lives for? Well, it's a fact that what they lived and died for was and is true to this day. Jesus came to save, and by believing in that, life here on earth doesn't hold the end all to living. 
Have you come to a belief in what you've heard today? We'd like to know. If you go to the waymedia.net, you'll find a questions and comments link. Go ahead and fill out this form, and we'd like to know what you gain from today's teaching, as well as anything we can be praying for. You can also listen to additional messages in this series and other books of the Bible in the Come to the Table section at thewaymedia.net. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but Pastor Mark has more to share from the exciting book of Acts. We're thankful that you are a part of our listening audience today, and we look forward to you tuning in to our next edition. So come hear more from Pastor Mark next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.